Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Kenneth Pierce. I'm a veterinary ophthalmologist and put together a short kind of slash short presentation about uh, veterinary ophthalmology, uh, the road that it takes to get there, as well as uh, just some kind of interesting uh, cases and such that uh, we see and do. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. I uh, have uh, lived there pretty much my uh, entire life uh, from a kind of middle class uh, household um, and um, went to obviously high school there and then left for college and went to Tuskegee University for undergrad. Uh, enjoyed my HBCU experience there and after uh, Tuskegee went on to uh, LSU for vet school. So my career here kind of travels all over the place uh, after New Orleans. So like I said, Tuskegee's in Alabama, then went to Louisiana State for veterinary school, spent four years in Baton Rouge, soaking up the uh, Bengal, the Cajun Bengal tiger there. And then uh, after my four years of veterinary school, went to the University of Tennessee for my small animal medicine and surgery rotating internship. Uh, which was a really good experience. Uh, definitely everyone at the at Tennessee and in Knoxville was uh, very nice, uh, welcoming, and um, definitely educational. Learned a lot there. After Tennessee, um, I went on and did a specialty ophthalmology internship in uh, Southern California. Um, that was with uh, Eye Care for Animals Group and a contract research lab. And then from there, did my uh, residency to in ophthalmology at Michigan State. So pretty much hit up the West Coast and Midwest. The residency at Michigan State was a four-year uh, combined master's degree, degree uh, residency. Um, so definitely um, had a postgraduate work as well as uh, clinical experience. Uh, then after the residency, I decided to uh, take on a faculty position and move back to Baton Rouge to work at LSU uh, as faculty. Um, and that was really fun. Now going back and seeing some of my, the clinicians who taught me, now I'm their colleague helping to teach the next generation of uh, veterinarians. I was there for a little over uh, a year and a half, close to two years, and then decided that um, as a new uh, diplomate that I wanted to get into private practice and do a little bit more, um, did a lot of more experience and, and a little faster pace there. So went to, excuse me, while before I left uh, Baton Rouge, I met my wife. This is my wife, Nina. And as any uh, person uh, in the United States now with technology, we all like to take selfies. So I had to, purposely put some selfies of her in here. Uh, from there, she went on to become, she was already a dentist and became a pediatric dentist. Uh, she went on to do a pediatric dentistry residency at Howard University uh, in DC. So she moved to DC and then I followed and went to Garden State Veterinary Specialist in New Jersey. So we were three hours away uh, and worked in private practice after uh, leaving. LSU. Uh, stayed in New Jersey for over five years. Um, really enjoyed the time out there. Jersey's a really good state. Uh, and then um, at the conclusion of Nina's residency, we decided to move down to Dallas, Texas there. So we took that trip all the way down, uh, began working at um, as an associate at Veterinary Eye Institute in Plano, Texas, and then uh, had purchased a little French bulldog named Vukare. Then we wound up having a baby girl who is almost two now. Her name is Morgan. And um, from after being in Dallas for a period of time, uh, opportunity arose to um, service an underserved area of the United States that was deficient in veterinary ophthalmology for years. 
they've had an ophthalmologist come in uh, like once a month to help service the area, but not on a consistent basis. So I started Veterinary Vision Center in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is uh, servicing the Northern Louisiana, Eastern Texas and Southern Arkansas region of the, the, of the US. Uh, that has been very good, busy, uh, and a great experience as far as being a business owner as well as an um, ophthalmologist. Um, and then as a spinoff from that, seeing initially um, I wasn't the only specialist in the area, but now the oncologist who was there has left. And so now I'm the only specialist in the entire region. And from there, I developed a new company called Vespacon, which is a veterinary specialty to primary veterinarian advisory support and concierge referral service, where we basically bring specialty medicine to uh, primary veterinarians and hospitals to alleviate some of the bottleneck of areas that don't have access to veterinary specialists. Now they have a network that they can uh, readily use um, and seek advice from and help manage cases. And then for companies or, or veterinarians or regions that have a difficulty with getting their cases into a specialist right away, we actually help to kind of procure timely referral appointments to those specialty hospitals and that way patients don't um, succumb to their illness there. So just a little recap uh, in a, some of these, um, this timeline as far as becoming a veterinary specialist uh, or even into just veterinary school is, uh, has been stated before. Some of y'all already probably know this. Um, so usually undergrad, depending on the program that you're in, especially if they have a, um, advanced uh, or, or pre-vet kind of program where you spend two to three years in undergrad and then um, on to vet school, those programs are uh, great and ideal. Um, but if you're the standard co undergrad college student like myself, you're there for four years, then four years of vet school, uh, then an internship, depending on the specialty, some don't require uh, an additional year of some degree of training, but some of the competitive ones do. Uh, definitely ophthalmology, which has a college of about 500, uh, a little over 500 ophthalmologists currently to date um, does pretty much, not necessarily require, but uh, pretty much every resident has gone through some degree of additional um, specialty training there, whether that's an internship or a fellowship or some other research experience or something. And then uh, the majority of the residencies in the U.S. are three years. There are some that are four that typically combine with a, a master's degree. Some even offer a master's and PhD um, combo, which is obviously a little longer process, but uh, it is available depending on what your goals are in life and what you want to do. And then um, depending on where you are uh, with things and how you want to go about things with your career path is there are also research fellowships that are offered to help uh, either gain experience prior to becoming a residence, resident or uh, even afterwards. If there's a particular uh, area of interest from a research standpoint that you uh, want to pursue and make uh, part of your career. There are some ophthalmology labs, probably the most excuse me, the ocular pathology lab is probably the most famous one is the University of Wisconsin's ocular pathology lab that offers internships and fellowships, uh, which are very educational. I did a um, little bit of an externship there during um, a small segment of my residency and I uh, was there for, I want to say three weeks and within that three weeks I learned so much, it was amazing. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, there are PhD programs, depending on what your um, level of interests are there. Um, I put this slide in here uh, just to kind of begin a kind of case discussion, and, and it, I, I just find it a little fun. So I, at presentations, we ask people, what species is this? by just looking at the eye, because part of being an ophthalmologist and part of our training is sometimes we're just given images 
uh, like this and we need to be able to interpret what's going on with it. Uh, and if you didn't know, that is an Asian elephant there. Um, I didn't put this in here to just ask you about the species, but also mainly to just consider the big picture of everything, right? Uh, it's great that you're investing your time into learning about uh, all the opportunities there are within veterinary medicine, as well as um, the path to becoming a veterinarian. Um, sometimes that can be a little bit um, overwhelming and and depending on how we are and what, what we're looking at, we can sometimes have a little bit too narrow focus. Just remember the big picture, right? The ultimate goal and let that be the driving force for where you're trying to go in life there. Um, yes, you know, sometimes the path is long and hard, um, but if it is something that you love and passionate about, it won't seem that way and you'll be able to thrive and be super successful um, because it is um, what you've worked hard at and, and mastered there. So uh, that elephant, by the way, also had a little bit of a grass foreign body in its cornea here. I'm not sure if my pointer comes in, but that little green oblique line underneath the red is a piece of hay that was stuck to his cornea that we uh, got out at the Baton Rouge Zoo. So here's just some, a uh, couple of kind of cool cases that as an ophthalmologist, uh, we see, obviously the majority of uh, the patients that we see are dogs followed by cats and horses. Uh, depending on the region of the world you're in and what you're seeing, sometimes horses outnumber cats. Um, and then we also see uh, exotic animals, raptors, fish, birds, you name it. Uh, if it's got an eye, we can see it, as well as primates there. And we're trained in all those uh, various species. The cool thing about the eye is that it has a, the basic structures are all there, going back to, you know, basic biology and such, but there's a fair bit of variation between the species, which is always interesting. One of the main things that got me involved in ophthalmology is that it is the one organ within the body where you can actually see the pathology happening. You can see all aspects of it from the nervous system to um, yeah, fluid being produced and the flow of fluid within the eye, um, optics and physics all come into play, um, as well as um, you know, you can do practice medicine and surgery. The surgeries are super cool, like glaucoma and cataract surgery and even retinal reattachment surgery is, is pretty amazing uh, what it can do. And it's a window to the soul. You know, your eye can really tell you, hey, I have other things going on within my body that is a problem, like high blood pressure or diabetes. Um, so, or I have a nutritional imbalance there. Um, so it's super cool. Uh, but anyway, getting to this case here, <clears throat> this is a, a 10 year old a Scottish Terrier that the owners came in with just a um, kind of white opacity on the eye there. Uh, but then when the dog turned its eye, looked towards its ear rather than towards its nose, we can see that this kind of brown pigmented rays uh, lesion just to the left of that white arc of fat within the cornea is actually a, a pigmented tumor, it's a melanocytoma, um, which is very similar to like a melanoma that you hear in people, a pigmented tumor, but that uh, tumor is a benign growth. Um, so all that was required was a surgery to kind of cut off that section of uh, the cornea and then patch it there. Um, so super cool and super common. Here is a case during my residency that is, um, I wind up writing a paper about. Um, this is a cat um, who was chronically on uh, oral steroids and oral cyclosporin, uh, which is an immunosuppressive drug for uh, an immune mediated uh, inflammatory disease process of his GI tract and um, has been on that for a while. And then slowly over time and suddenly his right eye became all blue and disfigured and deformed and started to leak fluid from the inside of the eye out. 
excuse me. Uh, and that's what this kind of tear that is running down his face is actually the fluid coming from the eye itself. That's called bullous keratopathy, and that is a little bit of a close-up image of it. Some of these lines here are actually just hairs on the surface uh, of this deformed cornea. Uh, and what has happened is that on the inside of his cornea, and this is his eye actually, um, after it has been surgically removed and analyzed, all of this is just super edematous collagen. Uh, because the inside lining of his cornea had um, detached from the inside. And so all the fluid within the eye was expanding the collagen, kind of like a dry sponge that's just been dipped in water and it expands. Well, it expands so much that it lost its integrity. And so all the fluid started to leak out. So he developed basically a perforation. That's something that is kind of rare. We don't see that often, but it's super cool when it happens. And I'm, it's unfortunate for this cat that it progressed so rapidly, very quickly, to where it had to have its right eye removed. And then uh, after surgery, the next day, the left eye started to develop the same type of lesion. So this image at the top is we put up a what's called a third eyelid flap to cover the um, the fluid within the cornea to cover the cornea to basically act as a tamponade, press up against it to prevent it from uh, developing the same lesion. So this is about a month and a half to two months after that flap has been up. And this is now just a white scar um, uh, for where that cornea tried to um, have the same disease process. And so here, uh, ultimately, unfortunately, that cat passed away due to systemic illness, um, but was still, at the time, prior to uh, passing away, was still visual within that eye, so you could still see, which is great. Um, but here is the analysis of that remaining cornea and some of this kind of less pink, gray-ish appearance of the stroma is um, the portion that is very devitalized and still somewhat edematous. Um, this bottom little uh, very eosinophilic appearing line that has a much zoomed in picture in the middle here that is folded over is actually the inside lining of the cornea that should be uh, at the bottom of the image on the left. Um, but that is the Desmase membrane that is detached and is no longer pumping fluid out of the cornea like it should, which is why the cornea became so fluid filled. So kind of complicated case, but super cool. Um, here is one of a uh, French bulldog. And if you look down here, is it got this kind of brownish raised lesion with hair coming out of it. So that's called a dermoid. That is something that uh, we see not only in dogs, uh, but you can see it in cats and cows. Cows are very common. Uh, and it is just a segment of hair skin in an abnormal location. Um, and that is one where we just took it to surgery, kind of shaved that congenital anomaly off and kind of sutured some of the conjunctiva to that area. Again, like just kind of create a patch to reinforce the cornea. That patient doesn't even know what happened. It's just all is good. Uh, and some other cool things that happen with ophthalmology uh, on, along the lines of congenital anomalies, there are a lot of inherited conditions there. And one of the main um, ones that we see very, very commonly is a condition called persistent pupillary membrane. And as the eye is developing the inside of the eye, there's a vast network of blood vessels that covers the surface of the uh, iris. And then as well as kind of inside the anterior chamber and as the eye is inflating, those vessels kind of fade away in time. Well, if there are certain gene mutations that aren't uh, signaled uh, or don't 
um, cause certain signaling to occur, some of those tissue remnants of those vessels or what have you don't fade away. Um, or not even of the vessels, but just of the tissue inside the eyes. Some of those tissue remnants don't fade away and they leave strands. And so this dog has just got a pretty significant case of uh, iris to cornea persistent fibular membrane where it is um, these brown, almost like web-like uh, structures stemming from the middle of the iris uh, and going towards the inside of the cornea there. Doesn't affect the sight, but definitely in certain breeds like the Basenji can be uh, pretty prominent, uh, pretty advanced and, and can uh, be a little bit of an issue. Other cool things that we see uh, that can be inherited or even acquired um, are conditions called corneal dystrophy. Uh, and so some of this is kind of fat um, or even mineralization that occurs within the cornea uh, over time um, that is usually either within the center or slightly off-centered and depending on the breed uh, or species can have varied shapes. Um, so at the top, the top two images are of this cavalier King Charles Spaniel that has this kind of oval um, lipid deposit with a really dense center. It's kind of almost giving it a ring type of uh, shape. And then uh, this corn snake here um, that we saw at the um, zoo in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, has this kind of rectangular uh, corneal dystrophy uh, underneath its spectacle there. So super cool, doesn't really affect their sight, uh, but sometimes can be associated with uh, cholesterol or triglyceride abnormality, um, whether that is inherited uh, or acquired due to diet there. We all like uh, young dogs that are playful and such, but sometimes um, one of the things that we also have to consider outside of the eye is just the facial skin and eyelid. And so this dog has a little bit of too long of a length of his eyelid margin. That's resulting in the kind of lateral aspect of it rolling in and contacting his cornea. So it's basically rubbing on uh, the cornea there. People, we don't have that uh, too Often uh, or rarely do we get that because um, typically our eyelid confirmation is pretty genetically well set. Uh, however, if there are certain conditions or lesions that happen, like you had a lacerated eyelid and then that healed, sometimes that can scar over and start to cause a little bit of uh, entropia there. Uh, Here's a corgi that has a different type of corneal ulcer. Um, it's called the uh, indolent corneal ulcer or skin. And that is one that spontaneously occurs and it is due to genetics. So it has a, that surface epithelium uh, has a gene mutation that prevents them to completely adhere to the underlying stroma. And so they start to lift up. Um, and in order to get it healed outside of treating it with antibiotics, uh, like we typically do an ulcer, uh, we do a procedure called a dimember keratoplasty. So this is one where we numb the eye and we use this little handheld Dremel tool to basically polish the surface of the cornea, roughen it up a little bit to give the new cell something to grip onto. And so this dog is awake. We have the eye numb. We're just holding on to it and it is just allowing us to do this little minor uh, outpatient type of procedure there. Within two weeks, that entire ulcer will be all healed and uh, it will be back to normal with minimal scar there. This um, was also first started in humans uh, for a condition called a pterygium, where there is a little bit of overgrowth of the conjunctiva onto the cornea there. And so one of the ways that they would uh, remove it is with this diamond burr. So we've adapted this in veterinary medicine uh, 
and used it for this particular type of altar, uh, which has been very, very helpful, as well as some other uh, corneal type of conditions there. Obviously, some of the main things that we people as well as animals get are ulcers, corneal ulcers. So here is one where this one eye has a lot going on. It's got a, a divot in its cornea, um, so it's lost some stroma. The yellow arrow is pointing to a bunch of cells within the cornea. It's been going on for a little while by the red arrow, which indicates that there's some corneal blood vessels starting to grow in, which usually indicates that it's been over a week of the eye being inflamed. And then uh, this white-ish gray area to the bottom right is uh, some white blood cells and some fibrin, which is like when the skin your knee and it gets real sticky before the scab forms. Um, so we know that there's some significant inflammation and even uh, infection within the eye. So again, the eye is the window to the soul. It kind of tells you everything that you need to know what's going on uh, by just looking at it. And here's some other uh, variable degrees of corneal ulcers starting at the top left where there's a fair bit of uh, infection and actual loss of the stroma where it's starting to be eaten away and kind of melt. Uh, and the top center is one where there's a pretty large just defect uh, where the stroma has kind of degenerated uh, but hasn't gotten down to the last layer. Uh, the bottom left one here is uh, very similar to the middle image, but uh, it's also depicting some more blood and pus in the inside of the eye or hypopion. And then the far two on the right are actually of a uh, horse with a severely melting cornea, very similar to the cat that I showed you with the bullet keratopathy. This is one that uh, was hospitalized right as I started my residency at Michigan State. Uh, with a really severe ulcer and that turned around and healed there. Yeah. And then we even get animals that have other systemic infections that can cause opportunistic type of bugs to um, develop within the eye. So this is a dog that has diabetes as well as Cushing's disease, which is high cortisol and has uh, developed fungus in both of its corneas there. Um, and that's why it has this kind of yellowish brown or olive kind of colored plaques on the surface of his eye because there's fungus uh, growing within it. We're able to resolve all of that and, and treat it. And then we get ones where we have either the cornea has been eaten away down to the last layer, like a dust metal seal is what they call it, or it's actually ruptured. So the two central images have ruptured there. Um, this bottom right one of a horse is also ruptured, and then this one all the way to the left, and this dog is actually about to rupture, it hasn't ruptured yet, that's the dust maze membrane. Here's just an image of one where, um, and a horse as well as a dog, we do what's called the side down test, where we put some fluorescein stain directly on the eye, and you can see a trail of fluorescein leak from the eye there going down to the lower lid. Uh, as it is leaking fluid there. And that just lets us know that this case needs to go to surgery to be patched there. And so one of the things and ways in which that we patch the eye is uh, through a conjunctival graft. So we take some of the outside conjunctiva, kind of rotate it down and suture it into the cornea. Here's one where the conjunctival was partially pigmented. And so they just carry that pigment on to the cornea. Uh, here is a cat that has a necrotic piece of tissue within the cornea called the sequestrum. And that uh, can develop uh, as an inherited condition in uh, Persians and Himalayan cats, or they develop it secondary to chronic corneal irritation. Um, and obviously that is kind of this black spot, almost like looking at mud on your windshield. So it's kind of obstructive and uh, limits the cat sight. So we took it to surgery and cut out that section of tissue uh, and did a procedure called a corneal conjunctival transposition, 
where we took some of the healthy normal cornea above it, split it in half, and then slid the top half down uh, to cover the defect that we cut out there. And here is an inflammatory mediated condition uh, in uh, a cat where these white surface plaques are developing on uh, this inflamed cornea. We've got a cytology of those plaques and can see uh, eosinophil. So these uh, cells with this pink granular material all within the cytoplasm, as well as all of these kind of pink rod-like debris uh, outside of the cells in the background are all eosinophilic granules. Uh, we put the cat on topical steroid drops, and within two weeks, the cornea, you would never know it had an immune-mediated condition there. And this is the same thing, uh, different type of immune-mediated condition in the dog, uh, a dachshund, uh, where its cornea is just infiltrated with a bunch of blood vessels due to inflammation there. We are all familiar hearing about cats with herpes. And so that's the kind of classic herpes, superficial ulcers there. And then lastly, uh, um, German Shepherd here with another immediate condition called panis, so chronic superficial keratitis, where he's got a bunch of vascularization and uh, pigment that's growing into this cornea, as well as his third eyelid is also inflamed and irregular. So ophthalmology is uh, cool. I know the, a lot of the images were mainly just on the front of the eye, but there's definitely a lot of things that go along with uh, the back of the eye, the retinas, uh, as well as uh, species variations. Um, fortunately for me, I've been able to uh, look at a fair bit of zoo animals as well, from lions, snow leopards, tigers, uh, ostriches, um, penguins, fish, snakes, reptiles, chameleons, uh, baboons, um, lemurs, and so forth, um, and then obviously elephants there. Um, the one thing I would say about veterinary medicine is right now, veterinarians are in high demand. The world is your oyster. You definitely have the opportunity to um, go anywhere and, and do this, as well as um, advancing your career being a specialist, which are even in, in higher demand, um, gives you significant job security. Obviously, the length of time to do it, the expenses associated with it are factors that need to be considered, but it's all doable and feasible. Um, and I would tell you, as far as if you're uh, of minority ethnicity, definitely those are um, something that veterinary schools are looking forward uh, looking for, um, especially in this day, age, day and age with our profession, as well as males. Um, um, used to be that veterinary medicine was the majority male. Now it is uh, majority female, which is not a bad thing. Um, but that is the change of the profession, as well as multiple and many professions throughout the society. Um, women are taking over, or have taken over, which is not bad. So kudos to the ladies. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I put my email address here at drpierce at vespacon.com. Hopefully, when you all are done with vet school, uh, you can Vespacon will still be around and you can uh, utilize it to gain support from specialists from around the nation on cases. Um, but definitely feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions. Hopefully, this was helpful. Um, Ophthalmology is not a, um, it's a really good uh, profession and good quality of life um, there. And it's super cool. Um, it is very detailed and, um, and I think as you get into any specialty, as you learn more, you realize that there's a whole new world of information to be known about one little thing there. So, um, Best of luck with everyone. Good luck on your exams and uh, good luck with vet school uh, applications and so forth. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.